Coming up, Native Americans in Minneapolis, Minnesota are fighting with the city over pollution. A community member fills us in. A Hawaiian net maker keeps traditions and memories alive and news from the nation's capital. I'm Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Hopa. Thank you for joining us. We start north of the medicine line in Canada, where the families of three high-profile murder cases are demanding police to take action. Last Monday, families of missing and murdered Indigenous people rallied outside of a Vancouver police station. That was for the deaths of Tatiana Harrison, Chelsea Poorman, and no Noel Ellie O'Soup, who were all reported missing to authorities. It was months before police recovered their bodies. Their family claimed the police let them down at every turn through insufficient investigations and inadequate follow-up on missing persons reports. In a statement, Harrison's mother specifically blamed lack of camera footage and appropriate testing, as well as transparency and data sharing through jurisdictions as examples in the department's malpractice. Advocates say an idea currently proposed as the red dress alert would be beneficial but doesn't go far enough. Now to Norway, where SoftMe Youth shut down the country's agency in charge of energy to make their voices heard. A group of indigenous youth and other prominent climate activists, including Greta Thunberg, occupied the Norwegian Ministry of Petroleum and Energy in Oslo last week. The activists chained themselves to the building, protesting a $1.3 billion onshore wind energy complex. The Frost Wind Project is one of Europe's largest wind farms, and its turbine activity frightens the reindeer the soft meat traditionally herd. In, two, in 2021, Norway's Supreme Court voted unanimously to strip the wind farm of its operating license after finding that its construction violated the soft meat's cultural rights. While the government has yet to officially release a comment, the Minister of Petroleum and Energy said the ministry will do what it can to resolve the situation. In Washington, D.C., legislation has been reintroduced to amend the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. If passed, it would reaffirm that the Secretary of the Interior has the authority to take land into trust for tribes. This act was overturned in 2009, leaving some federally recognized tribes concerned and some expensive litigation. Trust lands are used for various purposes, such as to promote economic development and to build community facilities like schools, housing, and health clinics. The legislation was introduced by a bipartisan group of lawmakers in both the U.S. House and Senate, including by Oklahoma Representative Tom Cole, who is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. Cole, who co-chairs the Congressional Native American Caucus, says he looks forward to working with his colleagues to pass this bill in both chambers and get it to the president's desk. The largest federally recognized tribe in the United States has hit a new milestone. The Cherokee Nation welcomed newborn Bryant Jones as its 450th thousandth tribal citizen. That was earlier this week when the baby was brought in by his proud family to be enrolled. The Cherokee Nation allows enrollment for anyone who can prove direct descent from someone listed on the Dawes or Freedman rolls. During the pandemic, applications for enrollment skyrocketed to over 3,000 applications a month. Out of the many citizens, about 140,000 live within the reservation and another 270,000 
2,000 live in the state of Oklahoma. A college's new tuition waiver program will help Native students earn degrees for free. Southern Utah University announced its plans to waive tuition for any Utah high school graduate that is a citizen of a federally recognized tribe. The Utah Native American Tuition Gap Award is available to any student who enrolls in a full-time program. In the past, many Native students have been accepted to the school, but few have enrolled. Danielle Suberbiel, SUU's Chief Diversity Officer, said this program is a starting point for the school's commitment to support current and future Indigenous students. For more information about the program and how you can apply, check out SUU's Financial Aid and Scholarships Office. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Native community members in the East Phillips neighborhood of Minneapolis, Minnesota are pushing back against pollution. The city council is planning to demolish a warehouse two blocks from the Little Earth of United Tribes housing projects. However, the community wants to convert that space into an urban farm and community resource hub. Ojibwe citizen Joe Bital, a volunteer with the East Phillips Neighborhood Institute, joins us virtually today to talk more about what's happening at Little Earth. Welcome, Joe. Thank you for having me. Let's start from the beginning here. How did land blocks away from a huge urban native, native community become contaminated with arsenic? Well, quite frankly, it's racist urban planning. Uh, we're all familiar with the 1930s uh, implementation of uh, zoning or ordinances, uh, redlining to be exact, uh, that were used in the area to uh, consolidate the city's undesirable residents. Back then it was Eastern Europeans, uh, specifically Jewish uh, immigrants. And through the years that uh, population has changed, but the outcome is still the same. Now it's just Latinx, indigenous and East African uh, residents. Um, but within that time, you know, after the, the declaration of the redlining, uh, pesticide plants and other industrial polluters were allowed to come into the area. Uh, specifically a pesticide plant that produced and stored arsenic-based chemicals in the area from 1938 uh, until 1963, so nearly 25 years. Uh, and it wouldn't be until 1994 where state health officials found high levels of arsenic uh, in the soil and the groundwater during, you know, a, the Hiawatha Reconstruction Project. So we're talking about a lane expansion of a highway next to the area. So we're not even talking about concerns from residents, but you know, further addition of pollution in the area. Um, it wouldn't be until 2007 when East Phillips would be declared in a Superfund site because of this contamination. Um, and the cleanup would last until 2011 in which nearly 600 homes would have their soils uh, removed. Um, about uh, 50,000 tons of it in total were uh, taken out of East Phillips, um, and then it wouldn't further be until 2019 when the cleanup was successfully completed. And, you know, with all of this nuance, you know, during this time, you know, community has been fighting for site control of the roof depot, which sits on Hiawatha, uh, 28th and Hiawatha. And, you know, as you discussed, folks want to turn it into a mixed use urban farm um, project so that it can deal with the, you know, core root problems that we see here in the community. You know, it's a food desert. Uh, you know, there is a heat island effect going on. The area is incredibly poor. You know, the average household income is about 33,000, where it drops significantly in Little Earth to $10,000 annually for a family. And so we're dealing with a highly diverse, highly poor area that is fighting for its right to breathe. Can you tell us a little bit more about this community of Little Earth for those of us who aren't very familiar with the Native community in Minneapolis? Yeah, it was actually helped founded by AIM in the 1980s. Um, and it's a response of folks who were tricked off of the reservation. We all uh, heard stories of our grandparents. Maybe some of us ourselves were tricked off of our reservations by Indian agents that you know, claimed that when they went to urban areas, there would be jobs, there would be housing, uh, there would be resources for folks. 
And that's what brought people to Minneapolis and all over um, the United States, only to find out it was a lie and they were left in poverty. And so AIM, amongst all the great things they were doing at the time, demanded a place for our indigenous relatives. And that's where the Little Earth of United Tribes came to be. It is the only Section 8 indigenous uh, preference housing in the entire United States. There are 38 tribes that are represented here to this date. And it's because of the injustices that, you know, were caused during that time. And as I mentioned, you know, the average income for a family is $10,000, but it's not uncommon for to see four generations living in one household. And so, you know, you have a very, you know, diverse and poor area that is two blocks away from industrial polluters. We're talking about an asphalt plant and a metal refinery that emits hazardous dust, fly ash, and fumes that are poorly monitored to this date. You know, statistics were coming out uh, for Minneapolis where, you know, folks 25 and up who live in this area die from, you know, environmental air hazards 37% more than those around the Twin Cities. And that's not talking about other issues that, that are also plaguing the area. Joe, tell us about what the communication has been like with the city in terms of what you all want and how you can achieve that. What have you um, been hearing from the city? I think it's no different than what our relatives um, receive from any type of governmental entity. It's patriarchal. It is when we go to the city with our own concerns, they respond back of, well, we're the experts. You're just poor, dumb residents. You are those poor, dumb Indians. You should be fine with just con a consolidation prize. And the consolidation prize is nearly 888 vehicles coming into our neighborhood daily. I just described that our air is already polluted and adding more diesel fumes to that will exasperate a problem that is already an issue for our relatives. And it, they're unmoving. You know, we're talking about full site control for this great issue to address the root causes in our in our neighborhood. But the city says, no, you get what we give you, nothing else, nothing less. I give credit to some of the city council members and leader and city leadership who have listened to us, who have fought for us. Shout out to, you know, Jason Chavez Cruz, Robin Wansley, Aisha Chugtai for being there behind us and being a resource for us when it comes to this fight. But when it comes to the mayor, I, I just don't understand what it is, whether it's pettiness whether this is a vanity project, but the city is hell bent in having consolidate its entire public works infrastructure into this area that already has, has high levels of pollution. Well, Joe Bital, unfortunately we've run out of time here, but thanks so much for being here. You miigwech, thank you. Native Hawaiians have been making special fishing nets for generations. First People's Fund has honored Charles K. Aloha Leslie for his work in carrying it on through the generations. ICT's Shirley Snavy has this interview. I'm a lavaia, we call it, a fisherman. And I did this all my life, you know, for like 70 plus years I've been fishing. And I started my journey in net making that five or five years old with my dad and when he started to teach me and I was helping him here. Yeah. Fishing's the one thing that I always wanted to do and, and did all my life. And I tried different jobs, but uh, I didn't want to do the other type of work that I did. So I just you know, kept going fishing. First People's Fund acknowledge Mr. Leslie's Hawaiian traditional net making. I'm the only one that teaching this net making. There's other people knows how to make net, but the net they make, they sell it and then 
you know, so they're not going to teach anybody how to do that because they don't want the competition. They want them, only them to make it. But I make my net, I sell my net, and I teach my net. I don't just keep it for myself, you know. When, when we grew up with my dad and uh, we only made nets for us to fish with, we don't make for anybody else. But then after he passed and I said, you know, if I'm gonna keep that tradition up, it's gonna get lost, you know. So that's why I, I went out and started teaching. So our net making tradition doesn't get lost, you know, so the, new, the newer generations can, can carry it on. His father passed down more than just traditional knowledge. Oh, look, he taught me everything. Everything I do now that I'm doing, he, I learned from him. Like we had an old truck, a Model A truck. And one time we went up to the hill and a truck was missing and all kinds. And I was about 14 years old. And he told me, well, we're going to go home and tomorrow we're going to overhaul the engine. I looked at him, I said, overhaul the engine, we fishermen, we're not mechanics. <laughs> and the next day we, we took the engine apart and put them back and it ran fine. And he was like, almost you can call him jack of all trades that he learned. I don't know his way he learned all that during his childhood growing up, but, but you know, anything we do, and we hardly did the, hire people to do our work. We did it all ourselves, but, but net making and fishing was our main tradition thing that we do. Fishing has changed over the years. Well, it changed a lot, you know, because, you know, equipment all changed and then technology changed. So, so everything changed a lot, you know, and then uh, like even our nets now, I remodified the nets to, to a different model where it can fish easier and better from when we started, when we started way back. Climate change impacts fishing in Hawaii. Yeah, I, yeah it does have a, a, a different things on climate change too. You know, I think it, the sizes of fish Coming in earlier, we're getting a lot more rain now and, you know, a lot more flooding and a lot more, you know, groundwater going into the ocean. So I think that makes it makes a lot of changes on our fishing gear. Yeah, I plan to just keep reaching out to the different islands and, you know, teaching them more about fishing and net, net especially the fish, net fishing, you know, I'd like to get that going. And I'm in two different communities. I mean, communities down in Oahu on a different island. And I got, uh, I think between the two different groups, I think I got 41 people that I'm, that's going through my class now. And my youngest is uh, eight years old and my oldest is 90 years old. I got a 90 year old uncle and a 83 year old auntie that came back. And she told me when the first day she came and she says, you know, you're never too old to learn. I say, that's a good way to think about it, you know? And I, I, I'm so happy that I can reach even the old people, not just the young people, you know? So, so because they never had the time or the, to learn when they were younger. And now they want to come back into the community and start, start it up again, so. So I, I'm happy that I can give them some knowledge of that you know, with net fishing. And, and I, I started net fishing when I was, net making when I was with, well, I was helping, helping. And I think I was more of a pain in the butt for my dad than when I was five years old, because I was just helping. But when, you know, as I grew up, I, I got in it really quick and learned a lot because at, uh, 14 years old, I finished one of my big nets that we call Opelu fishing. It's a mackerel scad, and that's the hardest net to make. And I finished one net at 14 years old, and then I started to fish that net, and then kept going and made bigger nets and bigger nets, and in all my life I did that. You know, my culture is a really giving culture. They they, they love people and always want to help people. And that's the way I do it. You know, I, I, 
I always help people, you know, like when I come in back in from fishing, I always have a bag of fish to give somebody who's on the ramp when I come out. The largest organization serving Native Americans and Alaska Native tribes met recently in Washington, D.C. That was where the National Congress of American Indians held its Executive Council winter session. For many, the highlight is the State of Indian Nations address given by NCAI President Fawn Sharp. ICT's Colby Kicking Woman was there and joins us now with more. Hi, Colby. Hey, Leah. Good to see you. Thanks for having me again. This is the first time in three years that NCAI met in person. What stood out to you as the big changes that tribes face? Uh, you know, I didn't see many big changes per se in the conference itself. You know, I think it was a feeling of a return to normalcy, normalcy since so many of these events in recent years haven't been held at all or have been held virtually. You know, you can see the joy and camaraderie among tribal leaders and uh, individuals who work on the Hill or in DC at different negative organizations. Uh, it was unfortunate uh, that Congress was not in session last week. Uh, in years past, one of the days of the conference is normally dedicated um, to allow tribal leaders to make uh, Capitol Hill visits and, you know, gives them an opportunity to learn, learn to navigate the halls of Congress. Um, as far as challenges for tribes, you know, certainly every tribe has their challenges individually. I think all of Indian country is eagerly awaiting the decision in Brekeen versus Holland, uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act case that was heard before the Supreme Court last November. Um, you know, there's always challenges to native voting rights, uh, housing in tribal communities. And, you know, it's always wise to keep an eye on DC for bills that are introduced related to Indian country for better or for worse. There were two young people that gave opening remarks before President Sharp's speech. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, the co-presidents of NCI's Youth Commission gave uh, fantastic speeches. Uh, you know, it's amazing, inspiring to see uh, what native youth are working on, you know, whether that's decolonizing data, uh, when it comes to missing and murdered indigenous people, food sovereignty, or, you know, working on the staffs of Congress people. Uh, you know, I certainly wasn't doing that in my late teens and early 20s. Uh, but NCAI has wanted to involve Native youth and uh, the organization's youth committee more in their conferences. Uh, so the remarks that the two youth gave before the State of Indian Nations uh, was the second time that's occurred. And, you know, uh, their Native Youth Leadership Summit brought together youth from across the country to help them learn to be better advocates for the communities, as well as, you know, allow them for networking with tribal leaders and, and other Native youth across the country. I want to actually talk more about President Sharp's speech. Uh, what were your takeaways from it? Yeah, President Sharp gave a very passionate, uh, you know, and fiery state of Indian nations. Uh, it was her last one as president of, of the National Congress of American Indians. Uh, there wasn't an empty seat uh, at the Rasmussen Theater at the National Museum of American Indian in D.C., uh, one of my biggest takeaways was, uh, you know, she called on in Indian country to seize the momentum that has uh, gathered over the last year. You know, native representation across the federal government has has never been higher, you know, with representatives in Congress, uh, you know, at the White House and across other federal agencies. Uh, and, you know, she said, while positive steps have been taken, there's, you know, there's still more that can be done, more that can be accomplished. Uh, but she also noted that, you know, tribal leaders are prepared for this moment and, you know, they just need to continue to show up and initiate change for, uh, for the betterment of, of communities in all of Indian country. Colby, you brought up a great point there. Um, are there any indications at all that President Sharp will, will run for re-election? Uh, I believe she is termed out um, as far as, uh, so I don't believe she is able to run again for, for president of NCAI. I want to actually talk about um, the other parts of NCAI. I understand there was a luncheon to honor some Native women. Yes, the luncheon was great. You know, you could feel the love and, and then the laughter in the room throughout the luncheon. Uh, it was a women supporting uh, women's luncheon that's been going on for, I think it was the 27th annual uh, time it's uh, happened. And it's become an event that's consistently looked forward to. Uh, Chief of the Mohegan Tribe and United States Treasurer Mary Lynn uh, Malerba was honored, as well as uh, President of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians, uh, Shannon Halsey. 
Uh, Minnesota Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan gave the keynote address and um, you know, it's just it was just awesome to, to be in the same room as so many, you know, powerful Native women that are doing great things in their communities. Uh, President Holsey gave a great line in her speech toward the end, um, something along the lines of, you know, it's like fry bread and women. If you don't let them rise, it's not going to turn out well. And, you know, Native women are a force to be reckoned with. And, and it was just cool to be to share the room with them. That's quite the saying there. <laughs> um, Colby, what else are you working on right now? Uh, well, you know, for the sports fans, it's it's the best time of the year. Um, March Madness starts here in a couple of weeks, and so I think it's going to be, uh, it's always fun, but I kind of want to look into see what Native athletes are, are going to be represented, you know, in both the men's and, and women's tournaments. Uh, there are a couple more Supreme Court cases uh, related to Indian country. One's going to be heard, I believe, here in a couple of weeks, uh, at the end of March, uh, with the Navajo Nation and, and water rights case. And then there's another one to be heard in April. I was just kind of doing a deep dive into that and, uh, you know, have coverage on those. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Colby. Of course. Thanks for having me. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.